Good morning, everybody. <sighs> All right. So we're in the UK, and anybody not from here, hands up. Oh, a lot of you. Wow, you got to escape your country. So nice. So in the UK, we have these old Victorian buildings. And the thing with the Victorian buildings is they tend to have very narrow architecture. So my children went to school here and it was really narrow, little corridors, little stairs, you know, everything quite um, together. And uh, this was a problem for a school in the UK. So the trouble was when the school bell rang, the kids poured out into the corridor. On their way to get to the next classroom, they'd be so congested that bullying would break out, fights, and they'd be late to their class. So the school said, you know what, this is a real problem. We need to expand the corridors. So they called around all these different architecture firms and got some bids. So the initial bids were coming in about 20 million pounds. Then they went to um, a guy, Alistair Parvin, and his company, an architecture firm, and they said, okay, well, hang on, take us through that again. And they talked about the school bell and the problems, and they said, well, before we do anything, let's, let's run a little experiment. So they went to the hardware store and they bought a set of little bells, individual bells. They turned off the main bell, put them in each classroom. Then it was up to the teachers at the end of the lesson to set that bell off. And of course, teachers are talking, finishing up something, so nobody set it off at the same time. And of course, the queuing problem was solved because the children would come out in gradual amounts. So they solved what was going to be a 20 million pound problem or solution with something that cost 750 pounds. Right? So this is my world. Um, I've been working with outcome driven work um, for about the last 12 years. And this is something that has, for me, dramatically changed the way we do things. It's getting people to think in a very different way. So we, we, this is really important because we live in very interesting times. Um, I was going over slides. I actually did get to go to one conference in the middle of the pandemic. There was one in Paris, which was outside. When things let up, we were all out there and we could actually, when we thought things were turning to normal. But I did actually give a talk and in it, I had this slide which showed at the very top, the pandemic is one of the biggest disruptors. And it was quite a weird feeling to update that and put a tank and show war. And my notes from last year were all the things we were worried about seemed kind of small. I was like, oh, okay, we've now got what, monkeypox and everything else. So we're dealing with all these political challenges, regulatory challenges, um, economic uncertainty at the moment. So there's a lot going on and we have to innovate. This is no longer a choice. And when I talk about innovation, I'll just keep it pretty simple, but I talk about the sort of core incremental innovation, keep the lights on. That's what a lot of us are probably doing. It's making things a little bit better every day. So if you're using some sort of agile Kanban approach, then you're doing step backs, how do we make things better? There's a lot of this sort of incremental improvement. So this is what I call keep the lights on, it's making your existing products and services a little bit better. Then we have uh, this idea of adjacent. It's what I call the kind of keep up innovation. So you look outside your organization and you say, who else is doing interesting things? You might work in finance and you look at the insurance sector or you look at some sort of startup and see what are they doing that we could bring in. So bringing new ideas, new to your company, but not new to the world. Then the last sort is transformative. So this is that shoot for the stars, go beyond. How do we do something really new and radically different. And this is really important because when we're in the kind of current kind of crazy situation, it's the people who can adapt and out innovate the competition that really make a difference. I found this, um, take it with a bit of a grain of salt, although I do have my own data to back this up, that that continuous improvement, uh, small innovation, that gives us maybe um, sort of, you know, long tail 5% improvement over time. You, you spend a lot of your resources on it. It's your core business. Whereas actually that transformative stuff can have a huge payoff, especially if you're one of the first to market doing that. So, you know, I, I mainly work with pretty big organizations and everybody seems to be wanting to bring in innovation. Whose kind of pet thing this month is like, we must innovate, hands up. Your company's talking about it or your clients. We have a lot of consultants, don't we? Who's a consultant? I want to see who's actually consultants, either working for a consulting company or independent. Okay. 
So I get dragged into all these boardrooms and they're like, we have to innovate, which is to me kind of strange because I feel like we have to innovate all the time, right? Every time we do things, we're, we're constantly trying something different. But the, fir the first reaction is bring in agile. Um, so this idea of let's build it right, let's build it fast. And these what I call right loop thinkers, they're very good at delivering features rapidly. But it's really hard to know what to work on and even more importantly, what not to work on. So if you don't really understand your customers and really figure out what it is you should be building, I feel like we're pretty much building the wrong thing faster. So this is something I noticed in the very early days of Agile. We all got excited and people were like, let's build more features faster. Have you ever been in those all hands meetings where you get there and they're like, yay team, you delivered 100 features on time and on budget. And I'm like down the back going, yeah, but could you have done it with like three? That seems like a lot. Wow, you know, and on time and on budget, but did you actually make a difference or did we just deliver a lot of stuff? So we seem to have gotten really good at measuring how much stuff we create, but not really the impact that it makes. And if more features faster were great, a lot of you have seen this, but I always love this picture. Then if more features were good, more buttons on your remote control would be brilliant. So who wants more buttons on their TV remote? Right? Nobody. This next picture I, I, I love. So a guy went to visit his grandmother and they were watching television. And every now and again, she would get up to like, go get a cup of tea and put it on mute. Or she'd get up to change the channel and do it on the TV. Like who does that? And he's like, but you've got a perfectly good remote control. Why aren't you using it? And she said, oh, it's, it's just so complicated. I can't. So this guy was obviously a mad UX genius because he fixed the problem. <laughs> and if you look at that, what does it tell us, right? It's about you want to turn it on and off. You want to change the channel, change the volume. And this is what I call removing the inessential so the essential can speak. So when we do this sort of thing, and this to me um, is our organizations as well. You know that Conway's law? If we're built in silos, we have all these different divisions, a lot of fragmentation, too much going on, our products actually do end up looking like this. And this is really dangerous. It's not just a case of, well, we're building features no one uses, because those features end up taking us a long time to build. We then have to maintain them. We're actually using a lot of resources. Think of all that electricity you're using, all that power, right? And if we keep doing this and storing more and more useless features, we're going to kill the planet, right? So we're getting very good at killing the planet as software developers. So then the reaction to this is to say, well, we need to do a better job. We need to be customer centric and outcome driven and we need to think about the customers. So we often bring in things like design thinking. So these um, what I call left loop thinkers, they do deep discovery. Sometimes that's a problem because they end up in this analysis paralysis, trying to come up with the best thing. Or even more importantly, it doesn't matter if you have great ideas because your internal processes and systems kill them. Right? So I watch companies and I keep saying to them, don't just do innovation theater. Don't just do yet another hackathon, right? This is what they do. They have great hackathons. Everyone's very excited. Only, yeah, I can see some people laughing, right? We all do it. And then, then what happens, right? We get into our governance and we get into our financial systems, which pretty much kill innovation. And our daily work, right? All of those things pulling for our attention. So while we've got that keep the lights on, which we can justify the ROI, all the innovative stuff doesn't get done. And this is a real problem because this kills innovation. So people get really enthusiastic and excited about hackathons and innovation, and then their great ideas never get done. So then they leave the company. And most companies are saying to me, oh, we can't attract talent. I'm like, yeah, I don't know why, you know, could be this sort of thing. Who has that problem? I saw quite a few people laughing, yeah. Yeah, so this is where probably the majority of my work now, um, while it's really fun to do products and startups and innovation, I actually work on sort of hacking the organizational system. So I work with the executives to say, instead of they come to me going, oh, we need to innovate more. And that, they ask, how can we bring in more innovation, more hackathons? And I'm like, completely the wrong question. 
figure out why you can't innovate, figure out the barriers and those are the things we need to remove. So if you're not willing to change your incentive systems, if you're not willing to change your financial systems, your governance, these ideas of you know, multi-year business cases, those to me have been great during the pandemic because when people are like, we've got our process, we need to go through our business case, I'm like, okay, what did you think you were going to be doing two years ago? Oh yeah, good question. So um, this is how companies are getting disrupted, right? They, uh, they uh, just sort of keep doing the same thing. And I work also with you know, a lot of startups and scale-ups where literally they look at these big companies going, why are they slow? Why can't they innovate? Where are the problems? And that's what they go after, right? That's their market. So you will get disrupted. So it's about balancing up these ideas. And it's, um, this is Mobius, so we take them through the sort of discovery, decision loop, and delivery loop. And it's about building the right thing, building it right, but even more importantly, let's not just innovate our products, we have to actually innovate our organization. So we all see this all over the place at the moment. All models are wrong, but some are useful. I'm glad that people are willing to state that because the methodology wars, right? Scrum's the best. No, it's Kanban. And it's just every scaling framework on the market. Everybody promises to be the one right thing. And I don't find that very useful. So what, what, what makes models useful? Well, for a start, they should be agnostic. We talk about being kind of collaborative and you can't even get the agilistas and lean people in the world to agree, right? They don't collaborate very well because they all believe their way is the right way. So I actually bring this together with Mobius. So you'll see on the right delivery, you'll see a bit more of sort of agile, continuous delivery. Um, on the left side, depending on what scale you're at, because we use this for strategy, organizational design through to product, services, design thinking. And you can make these things coexist. So organizations can choose. Uh, we all have our own ways of doing things. So, you know, let them choose. Let them have a bit of autonomy. They help you ask the right questions at the right time. So for me, the big three that I always ask people, they say to me, we want to go to the cloud. We want to have a mobile app. Those are their outcomes, which they actually aren't. Because we have to find out what are the big problems that you've got? What problems do we have? Who are we solving them for? And then get that data, what's really going on. That means getting out and finding out. And then we create our outcomes. So outcomes are really helping us steer. They give us the direction we want to head in to improve. So if we fix the problems, how will we know we've done a good job? Then we come up with our ideas. Most people are sort of jumping from problem straight into solution mode. So you'll see this often where we come up with backlogs, then off we go on the right. So we're about delivering it. But we really want to measure what really happened. We had some great ideas. Did it actually make a difference? If not, we need to learn and adapt. So this means do we need to do more on the right loop, more on the left loop, what happens? And they teach you how to fish. This is my favorite part. Getting people, you give them the tools. This stuff's all open source. So I give it to people, teach them how to use it. And that's really effective. So people can take, well, wow, it's slow loading, isn't it? Do, do, do. Waking up after the pandemic. So we give them all these different sort of practices and they can choose the ones because we all have our sort of favorites and it's really about how you combine it. It's like that um, sort of modern cooking methods, right? They say, don't follow the recipes. We'll give you the core ingredients, then teach you how to mix and match them. And that's really what we're doing. So with this, you can create your own journey. And it's fun. You know, this was my last class before the pandemic in uh, Japan. What was very cool is because it's a really simple visual language that matters. So no matter where we are in the world, people can kind of see the pictures, they get really super engaged in it. And uh, this is something we've been using, uh, you know, uh, everything. I, I can't think of any area we're not so much in. And um, while we're working in all these areas, I thought I'd actually take you through some stories today, which aren't really in the software world because that's a lot more fun. So I'm going to draw up a loop and I'm going to quickly shift over to my iPad. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, something that I've worked on over many years with different companies, but this idea of hospital acquired infections or healthcare acquired infections. So um, when I first started looking at this, this was a huge problem. And with COVID, we've had a lot of issues, but this whole, um, the problem of hospital acquired infections is that, uh, about 250 people a day 
acquire these hospital acquired infections. So when you go in to get something done, a treatment, you actually end up the equivalent of, you know, 250 people, which is like a jetliner going down and all these people sort of dying a day. So that's a big issue. And usually when we go into this, um, I think what happened going back in time is it wasn't really seen as the hospitals used to um, send the cost back to the government. And the government actually said, no way, you're not doing that. You're not handing it on to the um, patients. So you have to fix this. And this is something that can cost, you know, um, many, many billions a year. So when you go through and ask the question, why, what's really happening? This is where we have to do some research, right? And find out what's really going on. So I like to look at this in three ways. How does the um, bacteria, right? This is my little bacteria. How does it actually get into the hospitals, right? How does it get there in the first place? And then when it reaches the hospital, how does it go around? So how does it actually get and transfer through the hospital? And then over time, how do these nasty little bacterias kind of grow and become big and horrible? So when we do this sort of thing, this is where we go out into the hospitals and we might sort of shadow the doctors, shadow the nurses, but in a really non-creepy way, so in a nice way. And uh, we do things like we put aphids on equipment because we're trying to see what's really going on. Why does all this happen all the way through? So we're looking at that whole value stream all the way through to figure out what's going on. And then we say, well, if we actually figure this out, um, what would be our outcomes? What are the things that we actually want to improve? So the big things we want to do are to actually decrease the number of HAIs, hospital acquired infections. We want to reduce the number of deaths. We also, and this is sort of interesting, want to reduce the number of infections um, that keep people in hospital. And all of this has a massive cost because every time we have to keep people so they get an infection while they're there, that takes up beds um, and it costs a hell of a lot of money, right? So we want to bring that money down. So we have all of this and because we've done our research, we know a few things. So we start saying, well, when people come into the hospital, uh, and this was a real issue when hospitals started trying to make more money, they actually opened up emergency so people could come in for their normal medical stuff. And that actually meant more people were bringing these infections in. So we start saying, how do we understand what's going on? And what you'll find when you do these first loops is you tend to go around and you're often doing a lot of research in this first loop. So you're trying to figure it out. So the big questions we'd be asking is, you know, when people sort of arrive at the hospital, what happens? How do they kind of bring in? And how do we know what type of people? I heard something, I think it was in the Netherlands, they said that, um, Americans apparently have far more of these um, infections than Europeans. So if you're an American, you go to emergency, they immediately put you in the, like, the naughty corner room. They're like, oh, disease people, go over there. So, uh, <laughs> so they start figuring out, and you might do things like a little survey, et cetera. You try to figure out what's happening, what types of people are creating this risk. Then you look at how does it get around the hospital? And of course, one of the biggest issues are the people. Right? So if we track the people, the doctors, the healthcare staff, they're taking these nasty little germs around with them. So is the different equipment, all the tools and machines and things we use. And then we also look at um, how does it grow? What's happening with the equipment, the machines and things that this bacteria spreads? So as we're going, we're getting this data back. And when I'm working with healthcare, it's kind of fun. Um, our challenge is how do we take that research and turn it into something actionable? So when we're working on a big patient healthcare system in America, um, they went from, oh, let's do a six month kind of research. We'll get all this great data and send it back. We're like, what? No. So we're like, no, Monday, you're going in there. We start shattering the nurses, the software team's there. And they were the ones saying, right, we're setting up a group. You guys just, as, as you go and you see something interesting, send it back to us. So we were actually fixing while we're doing research day one. So it's really important to get momentum, get that loop going, don't go into that analysis paralysis. So you go around and as you go, you're constantly sort of measuring, are we making any progress against the outcomes? And this sort of learn and adapt loop where we say, okay, what do we learn? What do we wanna do differently? So as we go, 
we find out that we have what we call these options. These are the different ideas we could try, but we're not sure what's going to work, right? So um, as we go through, you're like, okay, well, let's say we know that there's different people who have different kind of infections. One of the options might be, well, let's do a bit of an isolation, right? If we know that they're more at risk, we'll put them in an area until we can test them. Then we say, okay, so that's a little bit of, um, we could run that little experiment. Then we could say, okay, what about how they get around the hospital? So one of the biggest areas is people literally washing their hands. You'd think we'd be better at it, and I haven't seen the very most up-to-date stats, but when I was first looking into this, it was fascinating. They asked the healthcare professionals, especially the doctors, how much do you actually wash your hands? And they said, yeah, about 70% of the time. When um, they were being observed, it went to about 40%. And when they didn't know they were observed, it was about 10% of the time. So they said, when you have a doctor in your room or healthcare person, it sounds really rude, but ask them, have you washed your hands? Apparently that will bring it down dramatically. And uh, so, so they did this. So one of the hospitals, uh, Cedar Cyanide, was running all these little experiments. One of them was kind of fun. So at first they did a memo, right? So imagine you're over here. And I tend to look at things as, research, experiments, or deliver something, right? You're in one of these three modes. And so one of the first experiments was doing a little memo, which basically said, wash your hands, and they put it everywhere. How effective do you think that was? Nah, right? People are like, nah, I'm not gonna do it. Don't take away my liberty. Don't tell me what to do. So that made maybe sort of 10% difference, just because it's front of mind. So they went around, tried that, and they went, well, that didn't really give us, they gave us a little bit of a nudge, right? You're making a little bit more change towards your outcomes, but actually that's not really working. What else can we do? Um, they also tried things like, it was fascinating with the equipment. I've seen multiple iterations where they went through from um, uh, trying to disinfect things. And that's where you find uh, that actually it turned out a lot of the equipment, like, you know, those sort of pump nozzles and things, they literally didn't work. So when you give nurses and healthcare givers even 15 minutes a day of reflection time to step back and just say, how can we make things a little bit better? Um, there was a hospital in Melbourne that did this and they found just by changing out the equipment so it actually worked, it really helped. Uh, another one that was interesting is the equipment people want to save money and be efficient. This whole efficiency drive is often what kills us because they're not measuring the impact. So they try to get doctors and healthcare givers to see more people faster. Turns out that because they're rushing, they don't have time to sanitize their hands. They used to take equipment, well, they still do many hospitals, and they would use it for everybody, right? So you'd have one set of equipment for all sorts of people. Now it's less efficient, but by containing it, so we only use that healthcare equipment for one specific group, we actually can contain infection a lot more. So this kind of keeps going round, right? You're doing lots of loops, and that's what I, I kind of like, is we do the loops and we keep figuring out, oh, you know, does this work, does it not? And my pen is, oh, I'm erasing. Okay, so over here, you're doing lots of left looping, figuring out the problem. Here, you're delivering lots of stuff. But this is our decision point. So I often call Mobius a decision-making framework. It's an innovation navigator, decision-making framework. So it makes it easier to decide what are the right things to do. Now, Cedar Sinai, as they went through, the memo didn't work. So the next thing they tried was actually a Starbucks gift card. It was $35 and they had these little kind of robot things checking and monitoring. And so what happened when they bought that in, um, the surgeons, these guys are getting paid huge amounts of money. They just started running to wash their hands because they wanted to get this little gift card. So the numbers went up to about 65%, but it was one of those short term things, right? Because a lot of this is about changing behaviors. It's not just about getting the ideas. We can have the most brilliant ideas, but it's how do you actually get people to want to do them? So that was their next loop and they went, damn, you know, we're making a little bit more progress, our numbers are going up, but we're still not really getting there. Then um, after kind of looping through and thinking, you know, what are the real outcomes? How do we make this happen? Someone came up with a really genius idea, which I love. They got the healthcare people when they came in to put their hands in a Petri dish. 
Then they let it kind of uh, sit there for a week. And after a week, the bacteria grew. And so they created this really fantastic and super ugly screensaver. So the adherence went up to almost 100% and it's lasted. It's been incredibly sticky. And what they said, it's really funny, this is Cedar Sinai in LA, and they said they get all these messages from other hospitals going, can we please have your screensaver? And they're like, it's so ugly, but it really works. So this is how we kind of loop through and get that thinking. So as we go, we're like, okay, how do we make things better? How do we constantly focus on the outcomes, measure those, and look at changing the behaviors and trying out newer ideas? I'm switching to my little laptop smoothly. How much time have I got left? 24 minutes. I've got two st stories. Oh. Okay, I've got two stories. I've got an agile restaurant story, which is kind of cool, and I've got my Ukrainian one. I think I might have time for both. What do you think? Let's give it a go. Give me 10 minutes on this if you can. Okay. Has anyone seen Ricardo's restaurant story? Some of you might have seen it during the pandemic. Okay. Cool. I get it losing it. It was really funny. I actually got COVID super early on, went to America the very start of the pandemic. So I got it at the end of January. And in February, I was teaching and I lost my clicker and my Apple Pencil like 30 times in a day. I had long haul COVID. It's like Alzheimer's. It's the craziest thing. So maybe I've got remnants. Look, it went and now it's coming, going. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's like the 80s neon version. Very cool. Okay, so I'm going to take you through um, some really fun little loop stories. Um, so this is Ricardo's restaurant in... Uh, London. And I like to talk about the idea of if we want to innovate and get to that transformative innovation, we actually have to inject a little bit of chaos, right? If everything's too nice and too easy, we actually don't change. It's like, I don't know, if you exercise, which I don't do much, but um, if you kind of just go for a nice walk, you're never going to change. You have to actually put a bit of um, pressure on yourself. So on the right loop, I think we get into this kind of core innovation, making things a little bit better, but we actually need to disrupt some stuff. So the first disruption for Ricardo's restaurant was self-imposed. He said the margins were so low, less than 10% of restaurants, it's a pretty hard business. And so he'd read um, McChrystal's Tim Mateen's book and the, uh, one of Jess Sutherland's scrum books and went, right, we're going to do this. We're going to turn into this sort of scrummy, agile restaurant. So they did, and he um, brought in autonomy so teams could kind of select their own shifts. Um, it was very kind of about how do we make this a better business for the employees. So that was his first disruption, and they got into what I call the incremental innovation loop. So they're working on things daily. How do we make better boards and better visibility? How do we kind of make our menu a little bit better? All those smaller changes. But then we had an external disruption. Guess what it was? So in the UK, if you're not familiar, we had a lot of kind of thrashing about herd immunity. We're not going to close anything. Maybe we'll close. And then almost overnight, with little notice, Boris Johnson um, said all the restaurants had to close. So Ricardo's got a restaurant, and he knew if you lose momentum, it's really hard to get your business going. And of course, these were the shelves. Everything was empty. And a lot of people in central London rely on restaurants, right? Older people go there for social. A lot of people don't actually cook that much. So this was a bit of a shock. They didn't know how to cook. They couldn't get supplies. Now, one of the things that Ricardo does really well is he teaches people to adapt fast. I love this. He's got an Italian restaurant. In the middle of a busy shift, he wants to see, can people adapt? if something goes wrong. So he does a red tagging. He takes them out of commission their two pizza ovens in the middle of a busy shift. And then everyone's like, oh no, what to do? So then they have to go and use another oven, try something different. And he does it. If he notices there's someone doing too much in the restaurant, right? They're taking on too much burden. He sends them off on an errand and then everybody has to adapt, right? So this, this is this idea which I really love. It's constant crisis. Toyota runs pretty lean and so they run these constant crises where they never quite have enough you always have to be ready to adapt which is great although as we've realized recently they actually hadn't tested out constant 
big crises as well. So this idea of building up adaptability, we don't want to lose after the pandemic. And um, this autonomy was really important. When we had to sort of change the restaurant overnight, um, everybody could just pitch in and do their own thing. Don't forget there were no supplies. So overnight, um, they had to become a deli so that they went, this is one of the few businesses that won't close, supermarkets and home delivery. So then making little signs up. Um, those DHL boxes, they were great. I, I was talking to Ricardo, so we spoke every day during the pandemic on Zoom. And he had these behind him like, what are those about Ricardo? He said, well, I was taking my dog for a walk and the stationery shop was closing. So I kind of pulled over and I was like, what are you doing with them? I said, yeah, we're getting rid of them. He said, can I have them? And those became their food delivery boxes because they couldn't get anything, right? So it's kind of, I love that scrappiness. Let's just make do with what we have. So this is the five hour pivot in business model, right? This guy goes from having a traditional restaurant well, agile, but to saying we need to be a deli supermarket. They actually did all their own packaging. They made their own labels. He was like the best gorilla user experience researcher because I'd be talking to him. He loved talking to him when he took his dog for a walk because the next time he's like, Arr! and then he'd run off. And I'm like, what's going on? You know, what's the next installment? And he said, oh, yeah, I saw this beautiful place. They had all these really nice labels. So I took pictures. Now we're making our own labels so they look kind of nicer. Um, so they, 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 while the last customers were there, they took them out and they changed around the whole restaurant. So this is day one of lockdown. They were open, they were ready to go, it was that fast. They're very outcome driven. This sort of keeps you staring in the right direction. It's always been about the customers and the people working at the restaurant. So you don't just go to the restaurant to be a waiter, right? He says to them, look, what do you really want to do? Connect your purpose to the individual. And it's about, oh, I want to start my own business. So he's teaching them business skills, not just to work in a restaurant. It's also about the people in the community. They serve the community. So if you have a good look at that flyer, which they put through people's doors, um, we're here to help with home delivery, shopping. You're like, what's that about? So people couldn't get stuff, and they would actually go shopping for people. A lift to the doctor or station, so taxis were out of commission, a lot of old people in the area, and emergency repairs. Don't forget, this team was used to crises. He would break stuff just so they had to like get a welding machine out and like do something, right? So he's always testing them. So they had all these mega skills, and it was all about how do we serve the community. This was very cool because while they're super busy trying to do all this new stuff, right? Completely new way of working. One of the hospitals, um, because we were doing some live streaming, he was putting stuff on Facebook Live. One of the hospitals uh, heard about it, Chelsea Hospital, and they said, we need food. And so he said to the team, look, I know you guys are working, you know, a lot. Can you do this? And they said, yeah, we don't want to just serve, you know, London people food. We want to help the hospitals. That guy on the bottom left, I think he's like a billionaire. He was one of the neighbors who was like, let me help. So he's driving the truck and getting stuff out. So this made everybody feel kind of amazing. So you're listening to the story. And if I was you, I'd be like, that's awesome, right? This guy's done. He kept the restaurant going and that's all brilliant. But we don't stop there. So uh, Scott, where are you, Scott? Yeah. Hey, Scott. Scott was actually in a Mobius class and uh, we had Ricardo come in and they got a choice. We can work on like open innovation banking or the restaurant. Everyone's like, restaurant. So we gave it to the team. We said, okay, how do you make this? Let's disrupt it again. What do we do with this kind of restaurant idea? So there's a little Scott sitting there at the very top. And this is the uh, Agile training restaurant. So on the second last day of class, everyone's like, let's make it into like a whole theme kind of, you can learn Agile, leadership can come in, learn the skills through a restaurant. How fun would that be? And we're like, well, we need to test it quickly. <laughs> so that night, Ricardo put something out on LinkedIn saying, hey, you know, any interest in this idea? This guy in New York picked it up and went, great, I'm going to fund it. So Ricardo has now, about two weeks ago, moved to Florida. He's setting up this agile restaurant training center thing. And his whole team is running autonomously here, right? It's pretty awesome. He's, uh, the whole team like, has the restaurant and they're running it themselves. So this is this idea of constant disruption. 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Actually, that's pretty good. I'm going to flick back. So, okay, I've been doing this for a very, very long time. I started in Agile like 
I, I feel like I'm 200 years old. I'm not really. I must have been very young when I started. But 1999 with XP, Scrum. I did some of the biggest, you know, 250 teams at Yahoo, biggest scale stuff. I started doing outcome stuff like 12 years ago, or actually a bit longer, but anyway. And um, I kind of go, yeah, yeah, it's cool what we do, but I do sometimes feel a bit jaded. I kind of feel like, ah, oh, I've been doing this stuff for a while. You know, is it very exciting? Then um, uh, this happened. So Russia invaded Ukraine. So when this happened, uh, I was in Portugal. So I live in um, Porto, North Portugal. And so this was pretty terrible. I had some very good friends who lived in, well, yeah, lived in Mariupol, right? Where the, we all know where Mariupol is nowadays. So it was pretty shocking. I was like, oh no, they're stuck there. This is awful. I'm getting like Facebook messages where it's like the bombs are falling, you know, and then they go dark for a while, come back and then weeks with nothing. So that was pretty traumatic. I wanted to do something. So you jump from problem to the solution, which is I got with some friends. We found out where to donate stuff. We went to the pharmacy. We bought all the stuff, delivered it, and we felt good. Like, yay, we've done our bit. You know, who's done that, right? You donate to like Red Cross, you do something, and you feel like your job's done. Unfortunately for us, we're kind of agile people. We've been trained to really think in a very different way, which is, there's always a better. So I can't kind of leave things alone. I'm one of those people where you go to like a breakfast buffet and when there's a few lean people in the room, we're like, oh no, it can't be against the wall. Let's move it to the middle. We can have two lines. We can have smooth cues, right? So everything becomes a game of fix it. And so when I went round, I went, well, this is kind of crazy, right? Buying supplies at the pharmacy. They didn't seem very like combat worthy bandages, seemed really expensive. I was like, this doesn't seem like a very good idea. So I go into fix it mode, thinking I'd do something small. So um, I went in and one of the first problems is understood that people were building, buying the wrong thing. So people aren't always buying the right medication. They're buying too little for too much, so it's expensive. Um, they are, the big charities are moving really slowly because I was like, how do we make this better? But I'd worked for some of the big charities, done some outcome-based contract work. I knew how they worked, really slow. And um, you can't see the impact, right? We get very disconnected from charity because you give money and you don't know what happens. And people are very afraid of scammers, right? Are we giving our money to the right thing? So when I went through, I kind of thought about the outcomes. It's about, in this case, I was looking at medical. We want to get the right medicine. We want to get it for the best price. We don't want to be buying retail. We want to get it to the right place. Are we actually getting it into the hands of people who need it? We want to do it really, really fast and iteratively, and it's got to be legitimate. So this started when I called up a friend in the UK. She owns this specialist compounding pharmacy, Marianne Gluck, and I said to her, can we buy wholesale, right? I'd rather the money went somewhere. And she went, yeah, that's a great idea. Sure, let's do it. Then I wanted to get the right medicine. So this meant trying to hunt down and speak to people in the hospitals in Ukraine, trying to find the right people who could create the right lists. Because everybody, you know, when I spoke to some of the volunteers, they said, oh, don't buy more ibuprofen, right? We have boxes and boxes. We're getting too much of some stuff. We can't get the medicine we need. And we've got to get it there fast. Now, yay, Harry. Harry came along today because Harry's awesome. Say a big hello, Harry. Hello. <laughs> so Harry had a Facebook group, UK Aid for Ukraine. So I found them because I need people to take all this medicine over. So we already had about you know 15 grand just sitting there to buy stuff, but I couldn't get it actually to Ukraine. Like, how do you do that? So this is Harry's little living room down the bottom where he did such a grassroots, I mean, pretty amazing job. He just started saying, you know, let's not wait. So he used his own PayPal, which people threw money at. And if you don't feel comfortable with that, here's a wish list on Amazon. So people were sending all of these boxes. His poor fiance, like, do you have to marry that woman if she stayed through all this? They're just every weekend ripping at head boxes. And um, also, I was able to speak to one of the medics there. And the first thing when I said, look, I've got this wholesale medicine thing, we've got about 15 grand we've raised, you know, how can we um, do something with money? And he said, yeah, he said, look, we need antibiotic powders, we need these special things. He said, people are buying tourniquets from 
cheap places in China and they break in the field, right? So suddenly you're going, oh man, we all think we're doing the right thing buying for charity and we don't even know what we're doing, right? So this has to be better. Now, we had to get it there fast. So these are volunteers. Now, two of the people in there, and I thought this was, let's see, is that a laser pointer? Woohoo. Okay, so this is Clive Jenkins. Um, he was at Vodafone and he's now at uh, Virgin Media. So this is another guy, Royston, who's at Experian. We've got Harry, who's biotech, me. And what's really interesting, I didn't know it at the time, everybody was super agile. So when we came together, it was quite amazing to go, this pattern that I think you build up, right? In your head, you build up these ways of working. And you don't realize it's almost like a muscle we've built. And this outcome-driven thinking, it makes everything so clear and so fast. Like, no one wanted to wait. Um, Harry actually had stuff already in the country on the day of invasion. There are multiple drops going every couple of days. All these volunteers down here, and I love that. I love the badass picture at the bottom with Royston. He's got a spray can, so he's like, we're medical. Let's make it look like medical. So he, he just basically um, puts that together on their dodgy little truck, right? So these are people who have real jobs, who are driving all the way into Ukraine with all the stuff to get it there fast. I spoke to so many of the big charities, and they're like, well, we're doing a assessment and we don't really want to go over the border it's dangerous and you're like far out these people need stuff right now i mean we were literally getting doctors and surgeons just begging us hospitals sending videos like please help and one of the volunteers in um lviv hospital i said you know have you tried going to the big company he said yeah i call them up and they say we've given to red cross or you know one of the big charities our job is done he said we don't have anything right we don't have anything in our hands so we had to get it to the right place. This is Royston looking very happy because he'd gone all the way over the border. Very exciting. <laughs> and make it visible. This is the other part that, you know, all these lessons that we kind of talk about transparency and radical visibility. And it's really important to use it in everything we do. So people want to see their donations. So this is really cool. We have a little video on the website, Medical Now, Aid Now, which is... Um, the uh, mayor of Kiev and Kiev, and he uh, he's receiving all our stuff and going Slava Ukraine. It's very exciting that you can see it, make it all the way there, and make it legit. Um, we had to build all this is happening, by the way, in two weeks, right? I'm talking about within two weeks we set up a website. Everything's moving so fast um, through the kind of hive mind. Uh, one of the guys I know, Kubert. He uh, works for charity and he put me in touch with Action for Humanity because charities don't move fast. These guys did. They'd worked in Syria, so they knew how the Russians worked, what was coming. They were really good with advice. 10 o'clock at night, I get this guy, he was so busy, and he's like, we'll do it for you. So they put all the funds through so we can make it legit. So all of these things just working through quickly to make it happen. Then we got flow. You know, this was about, okay, now we kind of have a model, let's scale it up. It's interesting though, we almost over-engineered, so we've got this massive truck at the top, which we then had to rip all the signs off, because massive target. And uh, yeah, right, sort of obvious, but you're like, ooh. And I'm like, that's bad, right? We need to go back to leaner, smaller vehicles, and this was too slow. So we actually kind of got too big and too good. Um, and uh, now I'm trying to get all the medication actually from a wholesaler over on the continent. And I love this, help them help themselves. If you can't see that picture, these are medical kits and uh, our uh, designer, Harry, <laughs> don't you love how dodgy it is? These are like community medical kits, great idea. He just put, you know, medical aid on it. And that was about put them in communities because we knew when the Russians came in, you don't have hospitals, they're all targeted. So we needed to create this distributed model. And what's really nice is at the top, one of our, stop now, I'm on the last slide. One of the uh, medics, Connor, we've got all these medics now going over. They're actually doing all this training and we're actually shifting again into the whole psychological health and sending the right people over. So to learn more, go to Mobius Loop and to give even more, go to medicalaidnow.org. Yay, finished, woohoo.